<laughs> All right, this last work that we're going to listen to is a work by Hugo Wolf. And this one translates on a wandering. And so it has to do um, with the, the poet who's, who's walking um, through this town. And he hears this beautiful voice and the effect that this beautiful singing has on nature and on him. So this is a poem by Murica, Edward Murica, just like her work in Hyde was. And this is a really good example of Rolf's style. And so just to review some of the main characteristics of his style, Lots of chromaticism, and so this particular work um, is constantly changing keys, and you get to the point that you really almost lose your place as far as what the overall key is. This also has a sense of independence between the piano and the vocal part, and then another characteristic it just has to do with. Wolf's attitude towards setting the, the poetry, and he viewed, really viewed himself in service to the poet. So he would entitle these works poems for voice and piano, and he would um, place the name of the poet above his own and sign these. So this definitely has a difficult piano part, and vocal part. It starts out with a motive that keeps coming back. It's this wandering motive. It sounds like it's some music that would accompany a brisk walk. And song is a true composed song. So if you have your translations and pull those out, this is, this is how this goes. I entered a friendly little town while the streets were bathed in the evening sun's red glow. From an open window nearby, out over a bed of marvelous flowers, came drifting the tones of golden bells and a voice like a chorus of nightingales made the blossoms quiver, the breezes spring to life, and the roses glow in their deep red splendor. So this beautiful singing, this beautiful voice makes the blossoms shake, and it stirs up the, the wind, and the roses glow more deeply red. This is the first section of this which takes you through the first two pages, and it leads to an interlude for the piano that's kind of like a cadenza. So it uh, has double notes and is very um, big, brilliant. You have gone through a lot of keys up to that point. So it starts out in E flat major, then it shifts to C flat major on the third system, then to D major, on the bottom system of the first page, and then to D flat major on the top of page 33, and then to C major, and then to E major, and then it finally returns to E flat. So it's gone through however many keys that was, six or seven keys, so it's constantly shifting. Things slow down at the bottom of that third page, and then the voice comes back in and is saying, I stood there a long time, astonished, overcome by joy. And so, again, this is changing keys. Um, you still have that traveling motive that's going on in the, uh, the piano part. Um, so it goes through F major, and then it goes to A major at the bottom of page 35. And then the, the final section, um, it goes to the dominant key of B flat. 
How I ever left those grounds, indeed I do not know, but the world is beautiful here. And then um, on this page it goes, the sky is surging in crimson billows behind the town in a golden haze. So now this is a little bit further ahead. He's left the town. Um, how the brook is rushing under the alder trees and the mill is rumbling in the gorge. So just describing all these beautiful sounds and uh, images there in, uh, in this place. And then the whole point of this then is stated on the last page and it's you know, the uh, accompaniment then just has rolled chords and the, the text goes, I am bemused and intoxicated. O oh, muse, you have touched my heart with a breath of love. So it has to do with the power of music and with the effect on the sensitive uh, poet and this, um, this is one of the few that doesn't have to do with brokenheartedness. So it's like this one in The Earl King, which tells a you know, supernatural tale. Uh, all the rest of the texts um, that we looked at all have to do with broken relationships. And so when the, um, when the voice first enters, you can see how that is a melody that you don't have sounding in, in the piano. And so this is a, just a good example of, of Wolf's style.
that's the end of the section on German song. One of the main things to take away is just this new relationship between the voice and the piano, how they're equal partners in presenting all of the literal and psychological views of the text. So it has to do with that partnership. <coughs> So this review all the times I've talked about with um, these and different types of forms. Be sure that you can give a brief synopsis of each one of these songs so that you know what's going on in and, and, uh, ways that, the, that the, the music portrays the text. So. No one was as pictorial as, as Schubert was. He had the most kind of images with the musical patterns that he composed. But you do have figures like this, which you know have this kind of traveling idea that the piano presents. Um, and um, you know various other things that, that, are, that are talked about, which is some of the images that are presented in, in the piano parts. So the last section that we're going to talk about is a section on, on keyboard literature. And so I want to give just a, a brief background on acoustic keyboard instruments. So the oldest is the organ, which each of these keyboard instruments is going to um, produce the uh, sound music in a, in, a, in a different way. So they all have different um, mechanisms. And so the organ uses air rushing through the pipes. And there are basically two types of pipes. Flue pipes, which are like a flute, it produces air, um, vibrating air in a column that's enclosed and that air rushes across a sharp edge. And then the second type is, is a reed, uh, which has a double reed like an oboe. And so it has a more nasal sound, and it's used more as a solo stop. And about this, this basic idea uh, back to the ancient Greeks. He wrote about an instrument that's called a hydraulis, which made use of um, water and a bell that was submerged in this tank of water and air would be pumped into the bell and then the air would rise and then there would be a little um, tube that would come out of the top of the bell then that would be connected to uh, pipes. And so this was a type of portable uh, organ that then developed from this basic idea um, so another type is called a portative. <coughs> By the 14th century, then you start to have these huge instruments that are built in the, um, the churches, the cathedrals in Europe. They're especially popular in England. So it's the height of technology. And there, there are some really huge instruments that were made that could be heard, they say, a mile away. So they were sometimes used as battle instruments to rally the troops or to scare off the approaching army. And so the, the organ was associated you know, with the, the, the powerful um, social structures of the, the church and, and the court. All right, and then
then 14th century, two types of smaller instruments appear. One is the harpsichord, which produces sound with a plucking action. So you have a little piece of quill, it's called a plectra, that then plucks the string as the key is depressed. And there's an escapement mechanism with spring that then pushes the plectra out so that when it falls back, then it doesn't repluck it on the way down. And the harpsichord had different uh, designs. There were those which were rectangular, which were smaller. So you had the keys here, and the strings would be here. These were called spinet, or in England, the virginal. So they're associated with the young ladies who would play these. And there was also then the bigger design, which had the wing shape that is the design from which the piano forte developed. And so this is an overhead view of it. With the keyboards here, the biggest ones in France would have double manuals. And so, that was the basis then for the piano, which was, was invented later. So that was one type that used the plucking action. And then around the same time, smaller instrument, which wasn't as loud as a harpsichord, appeared, which is called a clavichord. And a clavichord, produce a sound by the use of what's called a tangent action. And so it was the simplest of the keyboard actions. And it just nearly had a little metal bar that was on the very back of the key <clears throat> that would then come into contact with the string and strike the string on that one point. But it would remain in contact with the string. So it had a unique property in that the, the player had, had direct contact to the vibrating string. And so there was a, a technique that developed with this instrument in which the player would wiggle the finger and that would give a vibrato effect. And so that's 